So in this Advent season, we have been uh, looking at this idea so far of fear. And uh, if you recall, this kind of comes from, just to kind of give you a, a little idea, the idea of uh, this idea of fearing less, kind of comes uh, from two parts. A couple of years ago, I did a Advent series uh, where each time the angels appeared to people and said, fear not. It's kind of a funny thing because um, whenever the angels uh, normally would appear to people, they would freak out. Because, and you probably would too, right? If an angel just showed up. And, um, and so they did. And so they kind of needed to tell them, like, hey, it's okay, it's okay, this is good news. Um, and so that whole series, uh, when we looked at those individuals, was called Fear Not. Then I encountered a, a sermon by Andy Stanley that talked about this concept that really taught me something, and that is that we actually can't uh, not fear. Fear is something that's built into us as a mechanism. Uh, it's there, and we, we're go we, even if we could, we would not get rid of it. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But like I said, we've been talking about this uh, idea of fear as a thing. Now, today, in the context that I hope to be able to share to you at the end, I want to talk about peace and whatever peace means to us, right? We don't ever feel like, though, we ever can actually achieve peace. And I think that that's because we rationalize to ourselves that we can't both have peace and have all of the worrying that we seem to do. Right? Worrying seems to really get in the way of the peace that we wish we had. Right? And worry, it, perhaps I haven't fully thought this out. Uh, if I haven't and you have a different idea, then email me or comment on the video here. I'd love to hear uh, what your take is. But my take is that worry is kind of the verb of fear. Fear as a thing, worry is kind of its action verb, right? I worry because I remember the past. We talked about this last week. We have this great gift to be able to remember the past and then project what happened in the past on possible future events, right? And that projection of that fear, that's the worry part. I'm imagining a future experience of a past experience that happened and it did not go well given the same situation and I worry the same thing might happen again. All right, so our running thought for these four weeks, we're in week two, is going to be this idea, this truth about fear. And that is that fear is the byproduct of the ability to remember the past and project into the future, right? And remember last week we talked about how there's a bad side to that, worry and fear. There's a good side too, anticipation, right? It's allowed humankind to develop the way humankind is developed because we can remember very far back. We can remember how our forefathers did things or did not do things and how they were successful or unsuccessful at trying to accomplish those goals. And then we can project that knowledge onto the future. That's a good thing. That's a mechanism of development in our world, of, of humankind. The problem is it brings this negative projection with it as well. Fear. And we talked last week that if you think about how valuable your imagination is to you, and that imagination and fear are inexplicably tied together, then if we had a button, a magic button down here, where you could come down here and you could hit the button and get rid of all of your fear, but at the same time, you get rid of your ability to imagine, I would guess very few, if, if any, body would actually take anybody up on that, right? And actually do that. So what that means for us is that when it comes to fear, it's not going anywhere. We're, we're stuck with fear. So, if we can't be fearless, can we fear less? Right? And we believe, if we know how to look for it, 
We believe that we can. It means that we can find peace as believers in Jesus if we know how to look for it in Scripture and apply it in our lives and as a result reduce a lot of our worrying. Now, what's interesting, and I'm going to bring up this little point about worry, and then we're going to depart from it, but we're going to come back to it. So kind of listen to this first part here. Okay, because one of the things I think is interesting about worry, the, the worrying part, the action part of fear, is what we worry about often reveals what is most important to us. The things we worry about, and the more we worry about them, I argue, indicates how important that thing is to us in the way that it shows our focus of devotion. What we worry about shows what we are most devoted to. Let me give you an example. How many of you have said, or perhaps heard said, right? if Johnny or Ginny or whomever was to jump off a building, would you do it? We've heard that, right? Or we've said that. You guys know what I'm talking about here. What's interesting about that statement is when we say it, what we're saying to our child is, look, the truth is, I don't care what happens to Johnny or Jenny. I don't, I don't care what happens to them whenever they fall off the building, they jump off, right? Because I'm not devoted to their well-being. But I am devoted to your well-being. I don't care what happens to them. But I do care what happens to you. What we worry about shows what, we'll, what we are uh, devoted to. Now keep that idea of devotion kind of there in the front of your mind. Because like I said, we're going to come back to that here in a second. But don't worry, when we come back to it, I'll make sure you'll see it coming. So let's uh, look in Scripture what the Bible says about worry and fear and peace. So let's turn and open up our Bibles. So let's unpack some of the wisdom that God has for us about fear and worry and peace. Now remember that Advent, the season that we're in, where we switch all of this stuff to blue or purple, right? That season is, uh, that word means uh, the arrival or the coming of, right? And so we are awaiting the coming, expecting the coming, the arrival of the Messiah, Jesus. Now, the characterization, or the characteristics, rather, of this coming Messiah we know about from an Old Testament prophet, uh, an Old Testament prophet by the name of Isaiah ben Amos. Isaiah ben Amos. He wrote a prophecy in the uh, Hebrew Bible, and it is referred to as Isaiah. In the ninth chapter of Isaiah ben Amos's prophetic poetry, we find these words that deal with the coming Messiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince, Peace. So, who is the child? Jesus. That's the easy one, right? Anytime, just go, go ahead and throw Jesus out. I'll try to make that the answer every time. Jesus is, the, is the, the, the child, right? And 700 years later, from when Isaiah wrote this prophecy, 700 years later, we find these words in the gospel according to Luke. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, that's Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. So this Messiah... Jesus, as promised, coming into the world, 
right? He comes to us as the Prince of Peace. And when we use that term, Prince of Peace, what we're really talking about is the coming of Jesus represents someone who comes to the earth that has the power to give peace to mankind, has the power and has the ability, right, to give peace to mankind. But where does all that stuff come from? So this characteristic, this title, Prince of Peace, uh, given to Jesus, it's in your notes there. And you'll see that the word Prince of Peace is uh, is translated as Sar Shalom. These two, there's two words here, Sar and Shalom. Sar is a Hebrew word that indicates the one in charge, the Lord, the chief, the general. The definition of the word Sar is indicates someone who has the power and ability to do something. Okay? Sar. That's where we, when we use the word Caesar, 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 right? That's where the, that's where that comes from. Shalom. Now, a lot of us know this word shalom, meaning peace or meaning tranquility. But if you recall, I say this quite frequently when we're teaching or when we're preaching and we talk about the Hebrew or the Greek language, I always want to bring up, because without understanding this, you, you won't understand how we trans, uh, translate words. Both the Hebrew and the Greek language aren't languages to just define a word with other words. Both the Hebrew and the Greek language define words using ideas. Pictures, concepts, okay? So shalom happens to be one of these words that has kind of a concept that goes with it other than just simply the absence of strife, right? Or the absence of tumult, but rest and tranquility as well. But it also represents wholeness or completeness. And I heard a biblical scholar, a scholar of the Hebrew Bible yesterday, describe shalom this way. I thought this was fantastic. He said, whenever we think of the word shalom representing wholeness or completeness, think of it this way. The word shalom is used in the Bible to describe the building of a wall of bricks. Like, look around here. Like, see all these bricks, right? One of these walls, and it's a wall that is impervious to the elements. So the grout in between the bricks have been placed exactly right. And they have been mortared exactly right. So that the water and wind and temperature, all of those things cannot get through the wall. Whenever they talk about the wall's completeness or the wall's wholeness, they use the word shalom. So what we have here, Sar Shalom, if we think about it in the pictograph ways, what we have here is someone coming to us, in this instance the Messiah Jesus, who represents a characteristic of God being one who has the power and ability to bring to us completeness and wholeness. All right, that makes sense. No cracks in the wall. Wholeness, completeness, shalom. Now, with the coming of this Prince of Peace, one who has the ability to bring us wholeness as well as tranquility, I'd like to point out a couple of things I think Scripture points to that Christ being our Prince of Peace specifically brings us. One thing it definitely does, Christ being the Prince of Peace, is it represents A prince who comforts us. We read in the Gospel of John in the 14th chapter, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. And you see there I've kind of highlighted the word my peace. Not just peace. Right? The peace of Jesus I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Again, there's Jesus doing Jesus things, telling us, fear not, right? Don't be afraid. And we're like, Jesus, it, we can't not be afraid. Well, what does it mean? What does Jesus mean when he says, my peace? How does the world promise peace? And we give our devotion to that one thing. 
Whatever that is. How does, he says, I don't give it to you the way the world gives. So his, his peace is going to be different than world peace. And I don't mean world peace like, I mean the way that the world might think. Well, what is, what is peace in the way that the world sees it? Right? It's, it's being satisfied or feeling, having a sense of security. But based on what? Based on our accumulation of some thing or things, right? Peace, comfort, tranquility in the worldly sense means um, I have enough money in the bank. Or I have more money than I need in the bank. Or um, I have the car that I want to drive because my friends think my car looks cool. Or uh, my friends' houses are all 2,500 square feet or bigger. And so now I've got a 2,500 square feet house too, right? The problem with that sense of wholeness in the worldly sense is what? Is it doesn't completely satisfy, does it? When we get satisfied by things in the world, what does it do? What does it, do? it creates for us just a desire to get more of whatever that stuff was. It actually does the opposite of peace. It brings us anxiety. The peace, the sar shalom that Jesus offers is this idea of wholeness, of completeness, of receiving something that will satisfy you in a way that you will never want again. That's the peace that comforts us. That's the peace that Christ is promising to us in the gospel of John. In Philippians, in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians in the fourth chapter, we see two verses, six and seven here, where the, where the Apostle Paul explains uh, this idea of the peace that, brings, that Jesus brings to us. And the Apostle Paul tries the same avenue as Jesus. Hey, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. My guess is he's saying that from prison, right? He's, he's chained to a wall. He only gets fed if his friends remember to bring him food for the day. The only people that he has to talk to if they don't show up are the guards who hate him. So he tries to convert them to be Christians. And this is a guy who somehow or another they've given a piece of paper. And the first thing he can think to write to us is, ha, don't worry about stuff. Don't, don't even be anxious about anything. He says, but in everything, by prayer and petition... By opening up our hearts and sharing and having that relationship with God. That God knows what it is that we need and want. That we trust by prayer and petition. That he will give us what we need and want. And as a result, we will have a relationship with him, offering him thanksgiving. With that type of relationship, whenever we have desires, or we have problems, or we have needs, or we have concerns, we will present those requests to God. We will recognize that we have done everything that we can do, and now we have to turn it over to God. And when we do that, the Apostle Paul says, <sighs> Peace. God, I've done all that I can do. Now I have to turn it over to you. God, I don't even need to tell you that I need this or I need that or this has got to happen. You already know, God. But even if it doesn't, thy will be done. Peace. That's the peace of God that transcends all understanding. It's a peace that will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. The peace that Jesus offers as the Prince of Peace, the one who has the power and the ability to bring us wholeness, is also a peace that saves us. In the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Roman church, we find in the first verse this, this one verse right here that says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we might be sitting there thinking, well, all of those sound like words that seem to go in the proper order, but I have no idea what that means. Justified through faith? What are you even talking about? I want the, the peace of, with God. I want that. But how do I get that peace of God? It seems like I need to be justified through faith. What does that mean? 
It means that we're saved from our sin. It means that through the power of Christ's resurrection, through the power of that sacrifice, God doesn't see our sin in our hearts anymore. He sees Jesus' righteousness. And that has justified us with God. And that means that, that mean, that's more important than any thing else in our lives and if we can have confidence and we can know that then we can be at peace with everything else that might happen to us in our lives that's peace with God he writes in the letter to the church in Ephesus in the second chapter Paul says this but now in Christ Jesus he reminds the people there in whom you once were far away But have been brought near through the blood, through that sacrifice, through Christ. For it is Christ himself that is our peace. It's Christ himself that gives us peace and frees us from worry. So, if we're worrying, what does that say about our devotion? If we're worrying about anything else, anything else other than our relationship with God, our devotion is in the wrong place. Now, that's true. And if you're a believer in Jesus and you're here today listening to what I have to say, you know that that's true too. But that also kind of sounds like exactly the kind of thing you would expect a pastor to say. Right? Because it might sound really great for you, Pastor Guy, but that doesn't, those words don't even seem real to me. Right? That might work for you, Jim, but you have no idea the strain I'm under. That might work for you, Pastor, but you have no idea what I have to do in this life to keep everything afloat. You have no idea what I worry about. And you're right. I don't. That's true. Right? So try this. Well, first, let me, let me ask you a question. We all have worries, and we, none of us are going to escape, escape them. I've got an hour and a half here in this sanctuary, and I'm doing everything I can to forget the things that I'm worrying about right now as a husband and as a father and as a pastor and all of that stuff, just like you, Christmas, the whole bit. And whenever I walk out of here, probably at some point, probably not immediately because I'm thinking about it right now, but at some point on the way home, I'm going to start getting anxious about all of the things I'm worrying about, just like you. I get it, right? But let me ask you this question, and this is why Advent is so important, because it helps us to consider things like this, and that's this. What if an angel showed up in your room tonight and woke you up and simply said, God knows? That's it. The angel doesn't come to you and say, I know that you have this health problem and God is going to cure it. I know that you have this problem with your son or your daughter and God's going to reconcile that relationship. I know that whatever, whatever it is, I know you need that job. I know you think you need that mate, that girl or that boy that would just, you feel like would just perfect your relationship. I know you need it. I'm not even talking about it. God's going to make it okay. I'm not even talking about that. Just simply, God knows. Don't you feel like your relationship with God would just be different just in that? Just knowing for sure? Because we think and we think and we think and we think and we think that God knows, but we never know for sure that God knows. That's the faith part, right? What if? What if? What if God just showed up one night in an angel and said, God knows? Well, that's probably not going to happen. If it does, call me. I want to know about it right away. But it's probably not going to happen. So how can we trust that he knows? We believe that, 
that God knows. How can we trust in that without the angel? Because of Jesus. Because of the Sar Shalom. Because Jesus showed up here on earth. Every question we've ever had. Every statement God has ever made. Every promise God has made His people. Every single... It's not even a matter of is the answer yes or no anymore, Scripture says. With Jesus Christ, every question is answered yes. How can we know that God knows what it's like to be a part of the human experience? Jesus Christ. How can we know that God understands the depth of our worry and our despair and our need for peace? Because He showed up in human form just like you and me. He experienced the human nature before dying on that cross. God knows. If your relationship with God can be changed by knowing for sure that God knows what it is right now you're worrying about, then you can have confidence that God knows. Because God gave us Jesus Christ in the world. He gave to us the Prince of Peace. And that is our truth. And that is our guarantee. And that is our promise that God knows. And that's why we can say, God, I know you know. But I really need to sell this house. But thy will be done. I've done all I can do. I have my faith and my heart in the right place. And I need that peace that transcends all understanding. And the only way I can get that The only way I can experience that peace is by placing my trust, my faith, and my devotion in the one person that can do anything about it. God. No matter what, God, thy will be done. Emmanuel, God with us. It's God's proof that he cares about us and that he wants us to be reconciled and he wants us to be made whole where no wind and no water and no freezing breath can get through wholeness secureness he wants that with us to have peace and what we worry about is what we're most